coming up today on the Donversations podcast. Your body, because of this cycle that we're dealing with, is in a constant state of fight or flight. We're constantly on edge, constantly shooting these chemicals of adrenaline and cortisol through our body and constantly believing that we're in danger. Our body itself, the nervous system, is in a constant state of fear, a state of fight or flight. It's in the sympathetic nervous system, and we need to shift over to the parasympathetic nervous system from the fight or flight mode into the rest and digest mode because you cannot heal while you are in a state of fear. You cannot Mm -hmm. heal while you are in a state of fight or flight. So before we even get to really learning how to deal with the thoughts and the emotions and the sensations, we need your body to start recognizing that it's safe. Welcome to another episode of Donversations. Today we have Benji. Hi, Benji. Hi, Don. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to have you. And Benji is a mental health coach and an emotional fitness trainer. So I just, I read all that. I was like, oh my gosh, he has to be on. So I want to go deep right away and just ask you, as far as the shadow work stuff goes, are does everyone have a shadow self Absolutely. Everyone has a shadow self, but let's uh, like, let's try and demystify that term a little bit because I would like that. Yes. So the term shadow work originally comes from Carl Jung and he was a brilliant man with a lot like he, he really did a lot of fantastic work, especially for his time. Um, But even I think that, you know, his approach was maybe, maybe his approach was good, but the way that he describes things was certainly a little, let's say, overly intellectual, very hard to kind of bring down to reality. Um, Really, what I think of, what I talk about when I'm referring to the shadow self is simply elements of your personality that you don't realize, things that aren't Things that you've spent a lifetime building defense mechanisms against, things that you don't realize are happening, patterns that you don't realize that you're doing, um, certain cycles that are going on. Like We develop our entire personality around certain defense mechanisms that we use to keep ourselves safe. That's just everyone on this planet, because no matter who mm-hmm. you are, or at least let's say everyone in the modern Western world, maybe if, you're, if you were born in a monastery in China you know, and you never (laughs) left there, maybe it's a little different for you. I don't know. Right. But every person in the modern Western world has built up their identity around these defense mechanisms that we use to keep ourselves safe. So something as simple as, you know, when you were, would would get punished from your parents, maybe you were crying in public and you were get told, you know, big kids don't, don't cry. And you, you know, you have to be brave. You have to be polite in, in common society right now, or you were with friends and you expressed something that you were passionate about, or you were just being your regular goofy self and you got made fun of for it and you got mocked for it. Maybe you lost some friends for it, or you were very open and very vulnerable in a relationship in a romantic relationship. And you expressed something that was really serious to you deep down. And maybe you got abused for letting that out or you got dumped because of it throughout mm-hmm. our lives. We learn all of these ways that, okay, wait a minute, being myself, expressing myself, expressing my emotions led to pain. And as rational thinking humans, we learn, okay, expressing emotions leads to pain. I don't want to experience pain, so what am I going to do? I'm not going to express my emotions, or I'm not going to express myself, or I'm not going to talk about this thing that got me into trouble. And we start developing our identity around all of these little ways that we make sure that we don't get mocked or we don't get judged or we don't get rejected. And so we build up these defense mechanisms and these habits that help us avoid doing those things that got us into trouble before. And the shadow self is really just all of the things that you don't realize. You don't realize that you're using sarcasm as a way to keep people uh, you know, at arm's length. You don't realize that you are not being fully open with people because you're afraid that you're going to get judged. You don't realize that you don't want to chase the the biggest dreams that you have because you're afraid of failure because people made you feel like you're not good enough. So everyone has those kinds of shadow things. Yes. Is it being in denial? 
Um, I don't necessarily think that I would put it that way because you you just don't realize it. Like it happens over such a long period of time that you completely forget that you've done this. So, so it almost is like it becomes a part of your person, quote unquote, personality, like your your identity. That's just who you have become because of coping mechanisms. Exactly. You just don't realize that it's happening. The way that I like to express it is picture your brain like an open field, an open field of grass or of wheat or something. And mm -hmm. when you walk through a field once, you barely leave a mark. But if you walk through it a hundred times, taking the exact same path every time that you do a hundred times, a thousand times, 10,000 times, you start paving a pathway that's really clear. A pathway that is so clear that now you won't even bother walking any other way through that field ever again. Because here, there's a, there's a paven path. Why would you walk outside of the paven path when it's easier to walk down the paved path? So you start doing these things enough that you start paving this path in your brain, and that just becomes natural. It just becomes how you deal with life. And it gets to a point where you forget that you were the one that paved that pathway in the first place. You just show up at the field and like, oh, that's the pathway. And you just keep on going that way. But you don't realize that you were the one that paved it and that that pathway could have been an infinite number of different pathways. It could have been completely different. So what is, okay, so clearly if, say, um, you have a parent that uh, demeaned you your whole growing up and you just came up with all of these coping mechanisms and how to deal with it and whatever, Clearly, the parent is the one that should be doing all this work, but it's you because you are trying to um, figure out why you are the way you are and how you are in relationships and all that stuff. So where does one begin if they have all of this hurt and pain from a relationship with a parent? Um, how do they how do they heal that and make it so that they are successful in their relationships and they don't do that to their own children going down the road? So please keep that question in mind. Remind me about it in a second. But there are two things about what you just said. Before I even answer the question of how do we change it, two things about what you just said that I kind of want to address. Number one, you're saying, you know, it's, it's because of the parents. And I just want to point out that why do you think the parent acted the way that they did? Probably because they were treated that same way. I, it's it's not necessarily a linear path where they were treated in that exact same way. Um, so maybe they were treated the opposite way and it was an overcorrection. It's not, it's not necessarily this linear path, but yes, your answer is right in that this is their pain and their trauma playing out. Mm -hmm. And they had their pain and their trauma because their parents had that pain and that trauma and their parents had that pain and that trauma and it's right. passed down and passed down. So, um, you know, we do want to just avoid some of the judgment and all that going on. Um, and then, you know what? I can't remember what the second thing that I wanted to say about the question, <laughs> um, but okay. So then in terms of how do we actually start solving this? Um, right. Okay. That's a big question that we jumped into without a whole bunch of intro there. But so, so let me start with how do we not try and solve this? In my opinion, like so much of what talk therapy is about, and I'm not knocking therapy as a whole. I just, you know, I, I don't believe that it's the ultimate path to getting exactly where we need to be. Um, it's a great step. It's a great, like part of your balanced breakfast kind of thing. Um, but a lot of talk therapy is about trying to figure out where this pain came from. You know, let's right. find the trauma in the past. Let's try and analyze. Let's try and figure it out. Once you understand that thing, that memory of where this pain came from, then we'll be able to solve it. We'll be able to deal with that thing. And again, I don't deny that that can be helpful in a lot of ways, but in my opinion, that's not where the real healing happens. So what really happens, what we're really dealing with is unresolved emotional energy. And I don't mean that in this spiritual woo woo kind of sense. I mean, like energy is a real thing. So think about right. energy like calories. You eat an apple that has a certain amount of calories and those calories get translated into energy. You walk, you talk, you eat, you know, your body uses those calories to produce energy to do the things that it needs to do. Similarly, there's a certain amount of energy behind our emotions. So when something happens emotionally, the body naturally has ways to purge it. 
It wants to scream. It wants to cry. It wants to shake. It wants to laugh. It wants to whatever. There's all sorts of ways that your body translates emotions into energy. I was just recording a webinar a bit ago, and um, one of the examples that I use is imagine that you are feeling really down one day. You know, you're very lethargic. You're very blah about life. You know, you don't have a lot of energy. And then you find out that you won the lottery. Then all of a sudden, you're going to be jumping up and down, and you have this huge smile on your face. You're going to be running around in circles, and you're going to be screaming, and oh, my God, no, my God, no, my God. Where did all of that energy come from? A moment ago, you were lethargic. You just wanted to sit on the couch. Now, all of a sudden, you're jumping around up and down. The emotional experience created energy, and or maybe it didn't create energy. It sent a wave of energy moving through you. Maybe that's a little more accurate. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, So the emotional experience creates this energy. The body then translates that energy into movement. It runs around. It smiles. It jumps. It dances. It laughs. It sings. It does whatever to purge to process, to use this emotional energy. But as we were saying before, over the course of our lifetime, we have learned not to do those things. So in moments of trauma, we store that emotional energy. We learned, okay, wait a minute. I'm not safe to purge and process this emotional experience right now. So it's like the head says to the heart, okay, hold on to this pain, and I'm going to come back around and deal with it later when we're safe. And Mm. the heart goes... Okay, so I'll remind you about me later. And my personal opinion is that the biggest um, impact that talk therapy has is it gives us the opportunity to let those emotions come to the surface. It's not about the analysis of the past experience that gives you the healing. It's about being in that place and sometimes and talking about the experience brings these emotions up to the surface. So our goal is to learn how to stop resisting that emotional discomfort and how to let this energy move through us. The thing is that your body is trying to help you purge every single day, all the time. When you are stuck in line at the grocery store and someone is taking a really long time to pay in front of you and that's making you frustrated, hey, guess what? That is unresolved emotional pain coming to the surface and saying, hi, here I am. You promised me that you were (laughs) going to deal with me when you were safe. Are you safe? Are you ready to deal with me? But we don't feel safe in that moment because we don't realize that that's what's going on and because we just never learned that we're safe in our life. So the heart is saying, hi, here's this pain. You promised me that you were going to deal with me. Can you deal with me? And we go, no. And we use our defense mechanisms and we push it away and we get angry and we get judgmental and we yell at the person in front of us. So that was an opportunity to heal. That was the buried stuff coming to the surface and all that you had to do was learn how to stop resisting it and learn how to, how to actually process this energy. So when you're stuck in line at the grocery store, when you're getting cut off in traffic, when someone mocks you, when someone is being rude to you online, when someone is crossing your boundaries at work, when a partner isn't listening to you, all of these things are going to trigger emotions inside of you. And we look at being triggered as this bad thing of, oh, I'm in pain now and I'm terrible and I need to protect myself from this thing that's happening. And while we do need to have healthy boundaries against people mistreating us 100%, self-love is a huge element of what we're doing here, a moment of getting triggered is actually the easiest time to do the healing because you've spent a lifetime stuffing this stuff away. You've buried it under the dirt and it's impossible or very hard to heal with something that's buried. But when you're getting triggered, that's the buried thing coming right up to the surface and says, hi, here I am. Can you deal with me? And if you go no, then you stuff it back down beneath the dirt and you add some more dirt and some more pain on top of it and says, okay, I'll come back later. So (laughs) your body is trying to help you heal every day. So how do we deal with this stuff? By learning how to recognize the emotional discomfort, not as a threat, but as your body's natural way of purging. And when you can develop the practical tools and skills that you need in order to confront that pain head on, recognizing that it is not a threat. When you're in line at the grocery store and someone's taking a long time to pay, you are not in danger. Even when a partner is not listening to you and is being disrespectful, you are not in danger. There are situations in life when you are genuinely in danger. Sure, that happens. Moments of abuse, moments of genuine physical danger, moments of health issues, 
and you know, even you know, I mean, we live in a tough world. There are moments of there are issues that we are genu- genuinely in danger for. Mm-hmm. But ninety nine percent of what ninety nine percent of us are dealing with, you're safe, at least physically, emotionally. You are safe to experience what's happening. Yeah. So that that's what I'm trying to figure out. So what do you, what do you do? Like when you get in that moment of somebody cutting you off in traffic and you just feel like your blood is boiling and you know, maybe that's some repressed stuff. What do you do in that moment? What do you do? <laughs> Again, I would love to give you just a super simple, Oh, here's what you do. But there's, <laughs> there's a few things. Like I said, you know, the, the answers to what we do can be fairly simple. But there's at least some understanding that needs to happen before we get to that. So let, let's let's look at something. Okay, so someone cuts you off in traffic. Now, there are a few things that are going to happen in that moment. And I'm going to say like number one to say the first thing, but it's not necessarily the first thing. This can happen in kind of any order or they all kind of mm-hmm. happen simultaneously and instantaneously. But number one is judgmental thoughts. How dare he? Oh my God, that was dangerous. That he doesn't know how to drive, get off the road. You know, the, all of yeah. those thoughts, all that judgment. Number two is a stress response in your body. You're, you're going to tighten up your shoulders. You're going to clench the steering wheel even more. Maybe you're going to bang on the horn or you're going to slam on the, on the roof on top of you. Like there, there's going to be this physical stress response in your body. You're going to tense up in various ways. And then there's the emotion an emotion of fear, an emotion of anger, an emotion of, I mean, I guess those are the two main ones that would come up in that that moment in particular. And those are separate experiences. But you don't realize that those are separate experiences and they all hit you all at once. Now, what we really need to understand about those separate experiences is that they manipulate each other. So the cycling negative thoughts and judgmental thoughts of, oh my God, get off the freaking road, creates more of a stress response in your body and creates more emotions of anger. And the stress response in your body tells your body that you're in danger. So it creates more fear and it creates more anger. And it also creates more of those cycling negative thoughts. Because while a lot of people talk about how your thoughts manipulate your emotions, not enough people talk about how your emotions manipulate your thoughts. When you happen to be feeling sad, you think more pessimistically. When you happen to be feeling happy, you think more optimistically. When you happen to be be feeling angry, you think more judgmentally. So the emotions will create more of a stress response and will create more thoughts. And the stress response will create more emotions and create more thoughts. And the thoughts create more stress response and more emotions. And around and around and around and around we go. Mm -hmm. So in a moment when you are getting triggered, to answer your question is we need to take control. I don't love that word control, but for the sake of this moment, to take control of the various elements of your experience there. You need to recognize that your thoughts are illusions, that it's not like you're judging that person so intensely, but your judgment is just, that's just anger manifesting itself. It's fear manifesting itself. Like, do you want, like, are you justified in being angry at them in that moment? Like having angry thoughts, judgmental angry thoughts, like kind of, but my question to people is, do you want to have judgmental and angry thoughts? Is that pleasant for you? There, you know, <laughs> exactly. So you think that it's a natural objective reaction to he cut me off. No, you don't need to think, oh my God, that asshole, when he cut you off. You're thinking that because your emotions are being triggered. So you need to learn how to handle your thoughts and recognize that they are illusions. You need to learn how to recognize the stress response in your body as simply a reaction, simply your body's way of processing the energy that's in that moment, the emotional energy, and you need to recognize the emotion as its own thing. And we, what I do with my clients is we develop specific tools and skills of what do we do with each of those elements. That's where the whole emotional fitness training thing comes in. You need to build the strength and the skills and the muscles to handle the cycling negative thoughts, to handle that emotion of anger and fear in that moment, and to handle the stress response in your body. And we need... Another reason why I I call it emotional fitness training is because you need to start small and work your way up. Like Mm -hmm. you don't show up at the gym and be like, hi, okay, because a lot of people, okay, we recognize our defense mechanisms. And even the way that you were asking this, you just asked me like, how do we deal with it? As if there's like an answer that I can give you right now that's just going to take it all away. (laughs) 
as if so if we're going to translate that into emotional wellness it's as if you walked into the gym on your first day and said all right benji i want you to show me how to lift 500 pounds right now and if i lift 500 pounds right now then i'm never going to need to lift weights again in my life i'll just deal with it right now i know that that's not exactly what you asked but that's how a lot no of i that makes sense though the way that you say that i get it yeah that's how a lot of people do it. Like, oh, I have this intense trauma. I want to stop. Um, have I want to stop being suspicious of my husband, for example, every time that he goes out. I want to learn how to trust more. So, how do I do that, Benji? As if I can just give you the answer to that. Without that's like walking into the gym. Okay, I want to lift five hundred pounds right now because that is the core wound and the core trigger and the core defense mechanism that's covering up a lifetime's worth of pain. So, oh, how do I lift 500 pounds? Well, if you want to lift 500 pounds, you start by lifting five pounds and then 10 and then 15 and then 20 and you work your way up. So first, we're going to develop the skills and tools. So it's like I need to show you around the gym first. All right, here's how we deal with the cycling negative thoughts. Here's how we deal with the emotions. Here's the bench press machine. Here's the bicep curls. Here's the various exercises that you're going to learn how to do. And then we start applying them with lightweight. So at the beginning, okay, well, you're going to learn how to deal with being stuck in line at the grocery store and how to not get triggered by that. And you're going to build your way up. And so we start doing this work. But often what happens, like, so when I start my work with clients, we develop these tools and we have to develop the tools one at a time because I can't just upload all of the information into your brain at once. So we develop them one at a time. And sometimes it'll be like our second week working together. And they'll come to me and go, oh, well, but my husband just triggered me in this intense way. And unfortunately, like in week two of the program, week two of our work together, my answer is always going to involve, look, th- I- I'm glad that you reached out to me about it and I'm here and I'm going to support you. But you kind of just have to trust the process because you haven't yet built the skills and the tools and the muscles to deal with something that big. Mm -hmm. So it's a process. You build those muscles. First, we get all of the pieces into place, show you what to do with the negative thoughts, what to do with the emotions, what to do with the sensations. And then you practice them even when you're not getting triggered so that when you are getting triggered, now when it's the five pound weight, okay, you learn how to lift that. And then the 10 pound and then the 15 and you build these muscles enough until eventually you get to a point where even you know, losing the love of your life. You know, it'll be painful, but you won't hold on to those emotions. You will learn how to allow your body to go through the purging process. So that's what, yeah. Every every person is so different and handle, you know, like three people could be in in a, a store and the store could get robbed and every that every person could perceive it completely differently. So do you have to change up how you have people learn how to lift these weights? Does it vary? Each person has a different way that you have to deal with them? Um, Do you understand what I mean? Yeah, I understand what you mean. The, the, the answer is kind of yes and no in the sense of, look, when I'm working with someone, you're right, every person is different. The way that I have to interact with them is different. Every single person is unique. Some people who have been through immense amount of trauma need me to be just more soft and more encouraging. Other people who are just down on themselves need sometimes a little bit of tougher love or just like, and it changes throughout the process. So mm-hmm. at the beginning, they need me to treat them one way. At the end, they need me to treat them another. And I mean, that's part of what I'm good at is seeing where someone is at and knowing how to treat them. But the tools and the skills themselves are more or less, like they are, they are the same for everyone. So think about it like this. If we're going back with the fitness training example, some people have a hunched back and some people have too stiff a back and some people, you know, have pain in their legs. Some people have pain in their neck. Everyone is coming to me with a slightly different problem. Okay. But the exercises for strengthening your back are more or less the same for everyone. I mean, in the sense of depending on what your problem is, you might need to use more of one exercise than another. We might focus on this muscle group rather than the other. But even when it comes to fitness training, you better work on your whole body. You know, if you have back problems, you don't only work out your back. 
You also work out your legs. You also work out your chest because you need to balance out your back and your chest muscles. And so that's how it is with everyone. So people coming in, they have different problems and different things. And there are like some people are struggling more with overthinking than they are with that turning feeling in the pit of their stomach. So they're dealing with different things. Some people have more specific abuse trauma versus just, you know, I I never learned to love myself. So they're coming at it from different perspectives. But the ultimate skills and tools of how do I handle my negative thoughts are the same. Yeah, I love all those analogies and the metaphors. Those are great (laughs) because it's true. Like you do have to, you have to work all of the muscles, all the, the brain cells, everything to get it all to work together so that you can heal it. I mean, it, it, it does. It makes sense. I love that. What, what prompted you to write a book? Like, did you have books that inspired you, but you thought I can do this too. I, I've got other things to say to add to this. Or what prompted you to write a book? Because that's a big undertaking. Yeah. So the books, um, firstly, there was just some, okay, let me say firstly, some part of me always knew that this is the work that I was meant to do. Maybe not this in particular. At a subconscious level, I might have known this in particular. Even at a conscious level, though, some part of me knew that like, I felt like I was here to teach about life. I just did, even from a young age, from 8, 10, 14, as a teen, like, I, I recognized that this was where my strengths were. And I knew that I was here to teach about life in some way. I mean, I didn't allow myself to believe that because what kind of a 14-year-old thinks that about himself? What kind of an arrogant asshole must you be to think that you have that <laughs> wisdom at 14 years old? But some part of me did feel that way. And even as a teenager, I had expressed to myself, like, if I don't write a book by the end of my life, I've done something wrong. So I know that like you talk a lot about spirituality and spiritual awakening also. So if I can mention that, like, yeah, there was a part of my soul that knew that this is what I was mm-hmm. here for. Um, and when I started really doing this work, you know, there were a few times, whether it was about the spiritual awakening or the emotional healing, where like I kind of wanted to write a book. And so I would sit down and I would start and I would write a few pages or I'd write a chapter and it just didn't go anywhere. It just wasn't time yet. And the first few years that I was doing this work, what I didn't realize is that I was writing the book the whole time. With every call that I got on with someone who needed my help, with every moment that I spoke to a client, every bit that I created my course and created my webinars and created everything else, I was writing the books the whole time. So it was in, I think, like, February, maybe, of 2021, it was like the, my higher self just took over and the books just flowed out of me. I wrote both of those books in a month, wrote and edited them, edited them myself in a month. Oh my gosh. Okay. I didn't realize you had two. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> the only one I knew of was feelings first. So what's the other one? Uh, so feelings first shadow work is the first one. And the second one is called 10 mind hacks for quicker emotional healing. Mm, and, okay. And like I said, they just flowed out of me. I wrote them. Uh, I, I wrote the actual writing of them probably took me a week or two because it was just time. Like I had been practicing. It was just at a certain point. I now had the outline in my head. And once I had the outline of like, okay, here are the chapter titles each chapter was basically already written in my head because I had said those things a thousand times already on calls, on webinars with clients. I had been speaking them for years and writing them in posts. So it was just time. Natural. It just came natural to you. That's awesome. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Are there people that never deal with their shadows? You know, like they just shove them all down and keep them down. It, does that lead to actual physical health issues, in your opinion, like heart issues and all that stuff, if you don't deal with the internal stuff like that? Yeah. I would say most people on this planet never deal with their shadows. I optimistically believe that I think more and more people are dealing with it these days, Um But I mean, go back like 50, 60, 70 years. Imagine what someone would have told you in the 1950s if they said, I I want to work on my emotions. (laughs) If they used the term shadow self. Or if a child ever went to their parent and said, you know, you don't don't make me feel like I can be myself around you. 
it'd smack you upside the head. So right. for a long time, we weren't allowed in modern Western world society to, to even consider this stuff, which is why even though I'm not a huge advocate, like I don't believe that talk therapy is the greatest way to do the deepest healing that we need. One of the reasons I am so grateful for it is because it helped us bring mental health into the forefront of society. Yeah, We needed yeah. to go through this process where it started becoming okay to talk about our emotions and to recognize that, yes, emotional distress and mental health issues are real. So. Yeah, I agree. And I'm glad that it has kind of um, brought those issues out of the closet because they should be. Um, it's just for me, a lot of the times I have problems with the labels, you know, like saying the word trigger now is just so commonplace that I feel like it loses its intensity for what it is, you know, that some people actually getting triggered is a ginormous thing to them. And now it's just so easily thrown out there. I feel like it's made it lose its impact. Maybe. I mean, I, I have a huge issue with labels as well. For me, it's not so I like I understand what you're saying for sure. Um, for me, the word trigger is is less of one of those labels that worries me. I, I worry more about the labels of something like generalized anxiety disorder and clinical depression. Because people get diagnosed with this, not understanding that that is literally just a label. Like, it's just a name for what you are experiencing. The pain is real, absolutely. But you get given this diagnosis the way that you would get a physical health diagnosis. Like, with a physical diagnosis, okay, we call it what cancer refers to a tumor, something that actually exists inside of you. It's there. And other than surgery, like, but it's something that literally exists. And it's the thing that causes the symptoms... The tumor creates certain symptoms in your body and you go to the doctor because you have certain symptoms and then they look for what's causing those symptoms and it's the cause of those symptoms that you give a name to. With mental health though, it's different because you go to the therapist or the doctor or whatever and you tell them, okay, these are the experiences that I'm having. You know, I, I'm having that turning feeling in the pit of my stomach and I can't eat and I can't sleep and I'm constantly overthinking to myself and they go, oh, you have anxiety. You have generalized anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. And as I said at the beginning, that was very helpful because it allowed us to bring this into the forefront of society. It helped us understand and accept and acknowledge that, yes, this emotional pain is real. But now people take it and they see it as a diagnosis and like, oh, this is just something that I have. So, hi, I'm Benji. Hi, I'm a cis man. Hi, I have generalized anxiety disorder. It's a part of who you are. And by get, being given this diagnosis, now often people tend to wear it as a badge of honor. They're like, you know, they, they identify with the pain and the diagnosis. They associate with it. They believe the diagnosis makes them believe that there's nothing that we can do to get over this. We can medicate it and we can try and talk about it so that it's less stigmatized. But you have generalized anxiety disorder. Like you have leukemia or you have hypothyroidism or you have diabetes it's mm -hmm. have and that can be very dangerous because it convinces you that you're stuck with it yeah that's just who you are yeah, yeah that's scary what what would you say is a like do, what do you do do you meditate or what do you would what would you say is a good small step for somebody that's just starting out with doing this work what, what's a good way for them to start coping with things that they're dealing with when they start feeling our emotions coming up? So it's, it's interesting you use the word coping there. Um, I very much don't like the word coping because you cope, <laughs> you cope with something that is never going away. That's what the word means. It's dealing with something even though it's there. Right? Like what is the word like that to me? That's what the word coping means. You don't deal with something that's going away. You deal with something that is never going to go away. So you're developing tools so that you can just handle the pain and accept that it's always there. Um, so I don't love that word coping. I like I it's about fitness training so, so that we can actually start processing the emotions that are underneath this. Now, you asked about meditation. Is me like meditation is a great thing. Absolutely. Everyone should be meditating. I should be meditating more. Um, it's, it's a fantastic practice, but it's not in and of itself a healing experience. And most people do use it as a coping mechanism. 
Like you go throughout your day and the tension is building up and building up and building up and the anxiety is building up and building up. And then you go to meditate at the end of the day so that you can get yourself back down to normal, which is nice. But all that's doing is helping you cope with it. You get stressed out and then you meditate to bring yourself back down and then you get stressed out and you meditate to bring yourself back down. And again, that's great. I'm not saying that no, like everyone should meditate, but that's not strengthening you and it's not helping you purge and resolve the issues that are going on. Now, mm -hmm. again, like, so you asking me what can someone do at the beginning is kind of like walking up to an emotional fitness trainer and saying, how do, how can, how can my listeners get fit? there's no short answer to that question, right? I can't tell you, okay, well, if you want to get fit, do 50 push-ups a day every day. It's a great, that's a great tip, but that is no way a comprehensive answer to how do you get fit. The shortest answer that I could give to how you get fit is proper diet and exercise, right? And that's a more or less useless answer because everyone knows, yeah, proper diet and exercise, but what is proper diet and what is proper exercise and how do I do it that's right for me? So unfortunately, I can't give a short answer of what can people do to become emotionally fit. What I will do though, to try and, you know, give some answer to the question, I will give you one of the exercises that I use with my clients towards the beginning of the program. So one of the th things that we need to recognize first is your body, because of this cycle that we're dealing with, is in a constant state of fight or flight. We're constantly on edge, constantly shooting these chemicals of adrenaline and cortisol through our body and constantly believing that we're in danger. Our body itself, the nervous system, is in a constant state of fear, a state of fight or flight. It's in the sympathetic nervous system, and we need to shift over to the parasympathetic nervous system from the fight or flight mode into the rest and digest mode because you cannot heal while you are in a state of fear. You cannot mm -hmm. heal while you are in a state of fight or flight. So before we even get to really learning how to deal with the thoughts and the emotions and the sensations, we need your body to start recognizing that it's safe. Or ways that your body has stress responses in, or in, uh, in relation to your emotional pain. So a lot of people don't even realize it, but when you're getting triggered, you know, you start breathing really shallow, or maybe you even hold your breath. And even when you're not triggered in that way, most people aren't breathing properly. I mean, right. there are various different ways of breathing, but we want to learn what's known as diaphragm breathing. Because most people, if I ask them to take a deep breath, they'll go. Mm -hmm. And the way that they do that, if you do that, if you notice that your chest is moving up, and if you're sucking air in intensely through your nose, then while you're taking a deep breath, you're also creating a lot of tension in your body. Your chest is moving up and there's this tension in your neck because you're sucking air in so intensely. That's not like it's better than not breathing deeply, but there's still a lot of tension there. So we want to learn diaphragm breathing, which is there's this sort of film in between your kind of chest and your abdomen. You want to learn how when you're breathing in, you're breathing downwards and you're breathing in a relaxed way. So we want to practice diaphragm breathing throughout the day, even when you're not getting triggered. We want to practice calming our heart rate to the extent that we can. But even so, even when you can't just paying attention to your heart rate, recognizing when your heart rate is manipulating you like, oh, well, wow, my heart is being really beating really fast right now. So I'm getting more tense and I'm getting more agitated. We want to practice releasing the tension that we have in our muscles. We're constantly tensing up our shoulders or we're clenching our jaw or we're furrowing our brow. All of these little things that we don't realize that are happening, which are your body's stress responses, which as we talked about before, will create this cycle. Your body's in the state of fight or flight, so it manipulates your thoughts and it manipulates your emotions. And then we want to work on our posture because when you're hunched over or when you're kind of like you're constantly cross-legged and cross-armed or whatever in, in tight ways, your body can't operate fully. It can't breathe fully. Your intestines are being, you know, scrunched up and, and your digestive system can't work. So we want to practice these four things throughout our day. Practice your diaphragm breathing. Um correct your posture, pay attention to your heart rate, release your muscle tension. And the way that I instruct my clients to start practicing this, and everyone can do this right now, everyone listening, 
what you should do, take right now a pen or a marker and on the base of your thumb or on the back of your hand, I want you to draw a dot or a heart or a smiley face or whatever it is that you want. And for the next 24 hours at least, every single time that you see that dot, you go through this checklist. Heart rate, mm-hmm. posture, muscle tension, breathing. And you start getting into the habit of doing that. You start getting into the habit of keeping your body relaxed and becoming more and more, more, and more aware of when it's not relaxed. So that when you get triggered, you're going to recognize this that much more quickly and you're going to relax your body because that is the first step. If, you, if when you get triggered, your body goes into that fight or flight mode, then none of the rest of what we're going to work on is, is really going to work too well. So this is one of the first steps. I love that. That's that's what I was looking for. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you know, whatever way I was asking wasn't right because that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, just a way for people to become more aware of their body. Is that also a way of putting themselves in the present? Is that this? They go together. Well, absolutely, like, absolutely, because you're becoming more aware of what is happening in the present moment in your body. Mm-hmm. And by focusing on that, again, we are avoiding, to at least some extent, slipping into this subconscious cycle, where because you didn't realize that all of that was happening, now you're going to have more cycling negative thoughts. And because you didn't realize the thoughts were happening, now you're going to have more ang- emotions of anger and fear and judgment and shame. And because you don't realize that's happening. So by focusing in on an experience, on what's happening inside, it does connect us with the moment. And the other thing that it does, so a lot of people ask me from time to time, you know, I'm, I'm overthinking all the time. How do I stop thinking so much? The answer is you can't just stop thinking. Your attention needs to go somewhere. If you want to stop thinking, what you need to do is start feeling. Start paying attention to non-thought-based experiences that you're having. That's why meditation, I mean, one of the reasons, one of the reasons why meditation has you focus on your breathing so much Because breathing is not a thought-based thing. We want you to pay attention to the in and out. Pay attention to the the temperature of the air in your nostrils when you're breathing in and how it feels coming out of your mouth. The more that you focus on something that is not thought-based, the more that your mental energy moves away from what's known as the monkey mind and into the present moment experience. Hmm. Wow. Benji, seriously, I have just been hanging on every word (laughs) you've been saying. I don't know if I just really needed it today or what, but you, you are very um, clear in the way that you say things and it's, it's wonderful. So thank you for doing what you do and for putting it in a very um, tangible way, you know, for people that are maybe just new to all this stuff and they don't know what all this work is. And sometimes it can seem a little overwhelming, like too much. And so I guess that's where I'm going when I'm like, what's an easy step, you know, cause I think for people that aren't in this realm right now, or maybe they're just dipping their toes in it, it can seem very overwhelming for how they start the process of doing shadow work and things like that. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. When you look at the journey as a whole, anything that you look at as a whole, it it will seem overwhelming. If you're 250 pounds and you want to become 180, yeah, that's a long freaking journey, but you got to start somewhere. If you just take that first step and you keep taking steps, then eventually you get there. But it definitely seems overwhelming at the beginning for sure. Yeah. For sure. Okay, so tell people how they can find you. And and I already am going to ask you to come back again. <laughs> because I really feel like we just touched on it. And I would love to have you back and just talk more about it. So um, yeah, if you could tell everybody where, where they can find you. Yeah, I'll give you guys a few things. And yeah, it'll be my pleasure to come back. So um, okay, so for those who want a deeper overview of my approach to things, this whole kind of like just the, the overview of the approach, yeah. Um, then I would suggest you start with the book Feelings First Shadow Work. You can find it anywhere. It's on Amazon and Barnes and Nobles and there's the Kindle version. There's even an audiobook version narrated by me. Um, so you can find that anywhere, Feelings First Shadow Work. If you want some 
quick overall tips or just some interesting stuff, then you could start with the second book, 10 Mind Hacks for Quicker Emotional Healing. But in general, I think Feelings First is, is better if you're starting with one of the books. Other mm-hmm. ways, I have a few webinars that are out there. So if you are someone who was diagnosed with a mental health condition, like generalized anxiety disorder, clinical depression, PTSD, um, even bipolar or borderline personality disorder. And if you're kind of sick and tired of that label and you want to really understand what's going on a bit better and how to heal it, then I have a webinar called Healing Feelings First. You can find that on my website at benjisharercoaching.com slash replay. I also just finished putting together a new webinar that is very specifically about anxiety. And in it, we're going to like, I I, I said some of the things from that webinar in our talk today, so there will be a bit of repetition. But for anyone who's struggling with anxiety in particular, then I would say go with that webinar. You can find that at benjisharercoaching.com slash anxiety. And... Other than that, I mean, I'm around. I guess maybe you'll put links. I've got a Facebook group. I've got my Facebook page. I'm on all of the social media. I've been posting a lot of shorts to TikTok and YouTube and Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, And you can find me basically anywhere. Awesome. Yeah, send that all to me and I'll put that all in the show notes so people can find you because I think, like I said, the way that you word things is very tangible and it's obviously needed. You know, people are out there, they need some guidance and I think that you are a great person to help give that to them. So thank you so much for taking the time and for being on my podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was my pleasure. It was a great conversation. Uh, I was very glad to join you. Yeah. All right. Well, hopefully we'll uh, talk again soon. All right. Take care. All right. Thanks, Benji. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. 